Okay, again, thank you very much, Bob. And, uh, thanks for those instructions. Very important to really make this work. Uh, I want to introduce Tom Gilbert here. Actually, we're going to see Tom twice during this conference. Uh, this evening, he is our lead off hitter, uh, doing a presentation, a research presentation. And I'm going to do a little commercial at the same time. So if you want to read more about Tom's research presentation, his presentation is called Baseball's Man in Philadelphia, Colonel Tom Fitzgerald. Well, in this current issue, you, you all can see that, I hope. <laughs> no, this is not um, you know, QVC. But uh, we have here tonight uh, also signed in uh, Don Jensen, who edits uh, Baseball. Uh, a new research on the early game. And Tom's article, uh, more in-depth article than his presentation on Colonel Fitzgerald uh, is an article in this issue of baseball, Baseball 12. It's available through McFarland. I hope you all have an opportunity to get a look at it. Uh, okay, Tom, uh, Tom will also be the subject of our member spotlight interview on Saturday afternoon which will be, I'm sure, very interesting with Bob hosting that. So without further ado, I want to introduce a real Brooklyn guy, Tom Gilbert. Okay. Tom, it's time to hit your screen share and bring yes. your slides up. Doing so. And how's that? Yeah, there you go. Very good. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I could literally talk all night about my good friend, Colonel Fitzgerald, but um, Peter and Bob only gave me a half an hour. I, um, it won't be easy, but as we say in Brooklyn, I'll see what I can do. The grand theme of the amateur era is the amazing story of how an ancient New York City folk game transformed itself into America's first national sport, eclipsing cricket and driving the Massachusetts game, town ball and other regional bat and ball games into extinction. Baseball's main competitive advantage wasn't the game itself, but its ambition. In the 1850s and 60s, the baseball men of New York marketed and exported their game to the rest of the country. One way they did this was through New Yorkers themselves, baseball men who traveled often for business or for non-baseball reasons. Philadelphia, the home of town ball, was the first major urban domino to fall to the conquering New York game. Thanks in part to Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald, who co-founded the Athletics as a town ball club in 1859, switched in 1860 to baseball, and then quickly built the Athletics into the first great baseball club from outside the New York City metropolitan area. Well, there are two Thomas Fitzgeralds. The first is the famous journalist, politician, and national baseball figure. But there's another one that Thomas Fitzgerald said almost nothing about and who has long remained a mystery. Fitzgerald himself, from his birth into his mid twenties. It's my search for this man and what his story has to do with the spread of baseball that is my main focus tonight. So the first slide you're looking at is the uh, Colonel Fitzgerald in late middle age, looking the part of the Victorian artist and intellectual. I like the tousled hair. Um, this man was a successful newspaper publisher who had married into an old Philadelphia family. Uh, he was just the kind of influential figure that baseball was looking for in the late 1850s and 60s to promote the game in what was then enemy territory. In 1862, he was elected president of the National Association of Baseball Players, baseball's uh, New York-based governing body. A former town ball player living that far from the New York City metropolitan area might seem a strange pick for baseball's top job at that early date. But it is doubtful that Fitzgerald was either a baseball novice or a complete stranger to the New York baseball scene. Fitzgerald's career with the athletics is full of hints of his New York City upbringing and pre existing personal connections to baseball. For example, in Philadelphia in 1859, he was one of the dignitaries who welcomed the visiting Constitution Engine Company Number no. 7 of Brooklyn, the favorite fire company of Brooklyn's Irish Town, which was located near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Why was he there? Fitzgerald had no public office at the time in the fire department or anywhere else. Perhaps he knew them. During the early 1860s, when the Philadelphia baseball clubs wanted to improve their game by exchanging visits with New York and Brooklyn clubs or holding inner city baseball tournaments, 
Fitzgerald was the go-to middleman. Thomas Fitzgerald had a colorful, combative, even outrageous personality. Traits that came to the fore when, as an established national baseball figure, he jumped into the two most divisive issues facing the sport in the late amateur era, race and professionalism. In 1866, Fitzgerald castigated his own club for bringing in what he called hired men, players from other cities who were out and out mercenaries. He and the athletics went through an ugly public divorce that cost Fitzgerald his position as club president along with most of his influence in baseball. This slide shows a caricature that accompanied Fitzgerald's attack on the hired men in his own newspaper, the City Item. This image inspired a fan letter from none other than the prestigious Excelsiors of Brooklyn. And here we have a real life hired man, Lip Pike, the darling of baseball fans in, um, is there anywhere this man did not play? One of the hired men that Fitz was referring to was Patsy Dockney, a native of Hoboken, the other was Brooklynite Pike. Both were a bit rough around the edges. Dockney served five prison terms. His career as a power hitting catcher was derailed by a knife fight in a Cincinnati whorehouse that ruined his throwing arm. Uh, one of the reasons that no baseball history that I've run across gives an accurate account, full and accurate account of this incident is that Dockney initially gave the police in Cincinnati a false name. And uh, the highlight of my evening is going to be telling you what it was. Frank Robinson. <laughs> to a man like Colonel Fitzgerald, paying these men to play crossed the line because it violated baseball's rule against professionalism, but also and probably more importantly, because he believed that baseball and baseball players should be held to a minimum standard of personal morality. The men in charge of the National Association of Baseball Players in 1866 did not entirely agree, but that's a story for another thread. In the late 1860s, Fitzgerald used his newspaper to beat the drum for baseball integration, or something like it, by trying to shame white Philadelphia clubs into playing against solid African-American clubs like the Pythians, who had been rejected for admission to the National Association in 1867, an episode that led to the drawing of the first formal color line in baseball. This is a poster for a bipartisan pro-union, pro-Lincoln rally in 1863. If you look at the bottom of it, you can see the name of Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald described as a war Democrat. <clears throat> he later actually switched to the Republican party. Fitzgerald was a committed abolitionist and what was known as a war Democrat. He twice campaigned with Abraham Lincoln. His political views weren't unusual, but his opinions on race were. Fitzgerald despised blackface entertainment, which was quite popular in the middle of the 19th century, called it low and vulgar. He publicly mocked fellow athletics member DeWitt Clinton Moore for telling racist jokes in a lame African-American accent. Thomas Fitzgerald's racial attitudes seem modern and shockingly out of their time, but the fact that he published them in a newspaper with a large circulation suggests that there may have been more people with views like his than we think today. You've probably all heard the story of the tragic death of prominent Philadelphia African-American civil rights activist and leader of the Pythian Baseball Club, Octavius Caddo. The 32-year-old Caddo was assassinated on election day, 1871, by a Democratic Party thug sent into the streets to suppress turnout among African-Americans who'd recently been given the vote. I will not go into detail about this episode here, except to say that it makes for a fascinating historical what if. What if the first color line, would the color, first color line have been drawn if Colonel Fitzgerald had still been the popular influential president of the athletics when the Pythian controversy came up in 1867? As much as he enjoyed making people angry, Thomas Fitzgerald, the pillar of Philadelphia society was wealthy, well-educated, respected as a man of letters and a Protestant. He was also a shrewd baseball man. Fitzgerald took the field with the athletics only once that we know of in an intramural game, but he was too good a judge of baseball and baseball players not to have grown up playing the game. Because he was born in 1819, however, Fitzgerald's playing days, his teens and 20s, came during baseball's dark ages. We know that baseball was played in the 1830s. We have almost no names, numbers, or game accounts. Of course, in order to have played baseball at that time, Thomas Fitzgerald would also have had to live in or very near New York City. He was in fact a New Yorker born and raised. You may have met people who, when asked about their childhood, 
recite the same few impersonal facts, things like the exact time, date, and place of their birth, and not much else. Usually there's a reason, and not a happy one. When Thomas Fitzgerald was asked about his childhood, he would say he was born in New York City on December 22nd, 1819, on the future site of the Harper Brothers Publishing House, seen in this picture. He sometimes added he was working as a, as a printer at a young age when other children were in school. There was little more to the story as he told it. Family was unusually important to Thomas Fitzgerald when he was an adult. Later in life, he made annual summer visits to Ireland where he hobnobbed with aristocratic Fitzgeralds like the Duke of Leinster and the Marquis of Kildare, whom he allowed people to believe were his relatives. He was extremely close to his daughter and five sons who helped him run his newspaper, The City Item. All of Fitzgerald's sons played for Philadelphia baseball clubs, including the Minervas and the City Item's employee team. Yet Thomas Fitzgerald never, as far as I've been able to discover, uttered a single word about his mother, father, or siblings, not even their names. Searching for Fitzgerald's origins, I could not locate a birth or a baptismal record that matches his account, which given the state of records from that time isn't surprising. But the specificity of his statement that he was born on the site of the Harper Brothers Printing House is a clue that leads to a particular part of Lower Manhattan. In the 19th century, the Harper Brothers Publishing House was located on Franklin Square in the Fourth Ward, a rough neighborhood shared by printers, sailors, poor Irish immigrants, African-Americans and New York's earliest Chinese community. No one was living at that exact address in 1819, but just to the east of these buildings was tiny Hague Street, which intersected Franklin Square. Uh, it's no longer there. It was obliterated to construct an off-ramp for the Brooklyn Bridge. But around 1820, a publisher named William Collier had a printing plant at number five Hague Street. Collier was a cousin and business partner of the Harper Brothers. Here's a map of the Fourth Ward before the Brooklyn Bridge was built. The number one there is Little Tiny Hague Street. It's not there anymore. Number two is Franklin Square. Uh, Pearl Street is, uh, is still there. And that's where the um, Harper Brothers uh, that I showed you in the previous slide is located. Longworth's New York City directories of the early 19th century list only a handful of people named Fitzgerald. Many of them lived in the Fourth Ward, particularly in several households on Tiny Hague Street and nearby Oak Street. These families were probably related. The 1827 directory lists 11 people named Fitzgerald. One Fitzgerald wife, widow of Edmund Grocer. She lived at 8 Hague Street. Born in Ireland in 1774, her name was Ellen Fitzgerald. Her husband, Edmund, also born in Ireland, had died in 1823, leaving no money or possessions. Censuses from 1840 uh, list only heads of household by name. And then for the rest of the household, the numbers are broken down by sex, race, age, range and for African-Americans if they were free or slaves. Comparing all the Fitzgerald families in New York City listed in the 1820 and 30 censuses, there's one that fits most of what Fitzgerald said about his early background and who had a male child born around 1819, and that was Edmund and Ellen Fitzgerald. This family lived within literal spitting distance of a printing house owned by members of the Harper family. They had come to the United States in 1799, a significant date because it suggests that the Fitzgeralds were among New York's several thousand refugees from the failed Irish rebellion of 1798. Perhaps Thomas Fitzgerald inherited his republicanism, Irish republicanism. As an adult, he was active in organizations that supported Irish independence and opposed American slavery. New York City in 1823 was a rough place for a widowed unskilled immigrant. Some in Ellen Fitzgerald's position abandoned their children or resorted to prostitution. She had three children, Edmund Jr., who was 15 or 16 in 1823, Ellen, who was seven or eight, and a younger son, presumably the three-year-old Thomas. We don't know how Mrs. Fitzgerald survived the next six or seven years. The likelihood is that the family was desperately poor. Thomas Fitzgerald's childhood appears to have been like something out of a Dickens novel. According to Fitzgerald himself, he worked as a printer at a very young age. The likely reason is that Ellen Fitzgerald had decided to apprentice her youngest son to a printer as soon as he was old enough to have one fewer mouth to feed. Irish immigrant families of the time in particular were known to sacrifice some children's education for the sake of more promising siblings. Apprenticeships normally lasted four to seven years and were legally binding and apprentice, apprentices worked for free or for very little. We do not know how young Thomas Fitzgerald was when he was in effect given into temporary slavery. 
11 or younger was unusual but not unheard of. And apprentices often lived at their employee's home or shop. Many were exploited by their employers and hazed by older apprentices. And we can only wonder what kind of misery lies behind Thomas Fitzgerald's statement that he was, quote, working at an age when other children were in school, unquote. The re there's reason to think that the printer that Thomas Fitzgerald went to work for was the family's neighbor on Hague Street, Harper Brothers' cousin, William Collier. This gets a little complicated, but bear with me. Collier worked in Manhattan, but lived across the river in Williamsburg, where in 1840, he hired a fresh off the boat political radical named Thomas Ames Devere, who had, been, who had fled prosecution in the UK. He wanted Devere to edit a Democratic Party newspaper he was launching in Brooklyn. In his very entertaining autobiography, Devere writes that Collier paid him through an associate named Fitzgerald. If that name sounds familiar, Devere's son, Thomas Jr., born in Brooklyn in 1844, was an outstanding athlete who played baseball for the Marians, Eckfords, and Mutuals. He was caught up in baseball's first game-fixing scandal in 1865 and banned from the sport, but was reinstated thanks to lobbying by Henry Chadwick, a fellow Brooklynite who had something in common with Devere. His father had also left England as a leftist political refugee. The Devere's and Chadwick's probably knew each other. It would be surprising if they didn't. But there was no question that Tom Devere, the ballplayer, knew Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald. In 1896, after Thomas Devere Jr. died at pov in poverty at 51, a reporter visited his bare Greenpoint apartment and reflected on the former baseball star's faded glory. Quote, of all the many prizes he received, he wrote, none remained in his possession at the time of his death, save a book of poems bestowed on him by Colonel Thomas Fitzgerald, president of the Athletic Club of Philadelphia, unquote. All we know about Thomas Fitzgerald's life immediately before his arrival in Philadelphia in the mid 1840s are the names of some of the newspapers he worked for as he moved up from printer to journalist to editor. In his teens and early 20s, Fitzgerald seems to have been, like Walt Whitman, a restless printer and journalist, single and living alone. Did he resent being apprenticed as a boy? Did he simply want to put an unhappy childhood behind him? Whatever the reason, Fitzgerald moved to Philadelphia and decided to be someone else. Here's a picture I got from one of his descendants uh, that shows the young Thomas Fitzgerald. He founded the City Item as a weekly in 1847. He had three partners, friends from his days as a printer and journalist in New York. One of them was George G. Foster, who had invented a new kind of column for the New York Tribune called City Items. The original City Items was a potpourri of gossip, comments on musical concerts or plays, politics, crime, and city life, all delivered with Foster's urbane wit. The idea of Fitzgerald and his partners was to turn this journalistic innovation from New York City into a business plan for an entire newspaper in Philadelphia, and it worked. In the 1850s, Fitzgerald bought out Foster and the others and eventually made the item a daily paper. Thomas Fitzgerald married Sarah Levering Ryder of Germantown in 1844. We don't know what his wife and family knew about his early life, but the face that Thomas Fitzgerald showed to Philadelphia after the and the world after he became a successful publisher was largely a work of fiction. Fitzgerald gave talks on Mozart and wrote about opera, classical instrumental music and the theater. He published articles in poetry for Graham's Magazine and Godet's Ladies Book and composed popular songs. He had several plays produced, his greatest success being the 1868 Light at Last, which starred Louisa Lane Drew, great great grandmother of actress Drew Barrymore. Another part of Fitzgerald's self-reinvention was changing religions. In 1870, Fitzgerald and his three of his sons were confirmed with the Congregational Church, whose records note that only Thomas Fitzgerald had been baptized Roman Catholic. Finally, in the 1880s and 90s, he began making regular trips to Europe where he visited Maynooth Castle and Carton House in Ireland, which were owned by the Duke of Leinster, whose surname was Fitzgerald. American newspapers carried stories about Thomas Fitzgerald's visits to his illustrious relatives in the old country. But in 1888, New York's Irish American Weekly pointed out that the Catholic born Thomas Fitzgerald of Philadelphia could not have been related to the then Duke of Leinster. Uh, not to detour into a complicated aristocratic succession story, Thomas Fitzgerald was both Catholic and ethnically Irish. The title of Fitzgerald's were neither. Thomas Fitzgerald never explicitly claimed to be an actual blood relative of the Duke of Leinster. Perhaps the Duke socialized with him simply because he enjoyed the company of a gregarious American millionaire, and he wouldn't have been the first aristocrat to do so. What explains Thomas Fitzgerald's transformation 
from unschooled child of the slums into erudite man of the world. His wife had a good education. She may have taught him about classical music, but a more plausible answer is that Fitzgerald educated himself. In the early 19th century, a well-traveled path led from apprentice to printer, to journalist, to writer. Printers and typographers unions offered free night classes, libraries, and other forms of education. Many 19th century literary men arose from equally humble origins. This includes members of Fitzgerald's own New York City social and professional milieu, men like Rufus Griswold, George Wilkes, and George D. Foster. Rumored to have been illegitimate and raised in a brothel, George Wilkes did not have an expensive education, but he went on to publish a scholarly work on the plays of Shakespeare and his National Sports Weekly, Wilkes' Spirit of the Time. The child of a Vermont shoemaker, Griswold left home at 15 and educated himself while working as a printer. He became a published poet and literary critic. Fellow Vermonter Foster was another self-made man of letters. Thomas Fitzgerald's writing style tells us something else about where he came from. It is well seasoned with Bowery boy self-assertion and the joy in puncturing smugness and hypocrisy that characterizes Mike Walsh or George Wilkes of their subterranean or national police gazette days. Fitzgerald's city item initially used the slogan, independent in everything, an allusion to the subterranean, subterranean's famous motto, independent in everything, neutral in nothing. Meanwhile, back in the fourth ward, Edmund Fitzgerald Jr., Thomas Fitzgerald's older brother, was moving, moving up the Tammany Hall food chain. In 1841, he appears on a Democratic committee with publisher William Collier. Later that year, he's named police captain of the fourth ward. Edmund Fitzgerald and his mother, Ellen, moved into an apartment above the police station on Oak Street. In 1847, Edmund Fitzgerald ran successfully for New York City alderman, a lucrative position. The Fitzgerald family fortunes were looking up, but in 1852, the single and unmarried Edmund died, leaving his entire estate to his mother, Ellen Fitzgerald, who died five years later at the age of 83. There's one last interesting detail about Ellen Fitzgerald. She's buried with her eldest son, in the crypt under old St. Pat's and on New York City's Mulberry Street. I snuck in there by slipping in to a tour group uh, that had paid $45 a head. The in inelegant description on the vault's marble door, it actually says Ellen Fitzgerald's family vault, 1852, conveys the vanity of a single woman who after a long and hard life managed to afford an expensive exit. After hearing the full story of his early life, it's easy to understand why Thomas Fitzgerald never discussed it. He lost his father as a boy. His mother denied him an education and sent him out of the family home when he was a child. Even if he had no hard feelings toward the rest of his family, the sophisticated Protestant abolitionist pillar of Philadelphia society, friend of aristocrats and political ally of presidents that he became, did not need or want any connection to the Fitzgeralds of the Fourth Ward. Baseball's amateur era ended on St. Patrick's Day, 1871, when the National Association was formed. The new league welcomed hired men as long as they were white. It was a tr rough transition to professionalism for most of the top amateur era clubs, including those in Philadelphia, but the athletics handled it better than most. They joined the NA, won its first pennant, and remained competitive through 1875. They played one season in the National League. Like most of the other baseball greats of the amateur era, Colonel Fitzgerald was not involved with the sport at the top competitive levels in the professional era. But he continued to sponsor amateur baseball, and he remained an important figure in journalism, politics, and Philadelphia society. The city item prospered and made him rich. In 1888, he was discussed as a presidential candidate. In 1890, he retired, turning over his newspaper to his sons, and died the following year while on his annual trip to Europe. He's buried in West Philadelphia's vandalized and overgrown Mount Moriah Cemetery, a place as impoverished and neglected as the neighborhood he was born in. In life, Fitzgerald was a happy warrior. In the 1860s, he waged two high stakes public battles, one against baseball's racism, another for the amateur ideal and the young sports credibility with the Protestant bourgeoisie. In both cases, he fought the good fight and lost. But Fitzgerald won the most important fight of his life, that to establish and grow baseball in Philadelphia. He co-founded and built the athletics into Philadelphia's first naturally competitive club. And he deserves a generous share of the credit for the victory of the baseball movement itself a victory that gave us our first national team sport, the first professional leagues, and today's vast American sports industry. Okay. Okay. Tom, I... Yeah? 
I do yes. have a, I, I do have a question. I don't know. I think you, you may have said it. I may have missed it. Um, how did he get the, the title colonel? That was an uh, honorary title given to him by the governor of Pennsylvania uh, for non-military contributions to the war effort during the Civil War. I think DeWitt Clinton Moore got the same title the same way. Gotcha. Any other ones? Anybody else have any questions for Tom? Tom, you did an excellent job with that. It's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing story. You know, it's a kind of rags to riches story, but it's a story that also contains that he was such a champion of uh, the abolitionist movement, so forth and so on. The uh, even the uh, being behind the game uh, that the Pythians played um, against the Olympics in uh, 1869. So it's it's an incredible story. Yeah, on the on the what if that I mentioned, if you can imagine, if you know what happened in 1867 when the Pythians tried to join the Pennsylvania State Association, um, you can see reading between the lines that the uh, baseball establishment was very nervous about openly turning them down. And they asked them, they asked them to withdraw their application, right? Um, Fitzgerald wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been able to handle it that way if he'd been around, I don't believe. You know, he's the kind of guy that would have gone into a public fight over this. And you kind of wonder what would have happened if baseball had been embarrassed into allowing the Pythians into the National Association. Right, exactly. I did get a question here. Somebody asked, is there a full-blown biography in the works? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, by me? <laughs> it would be a good it would be a good one he deserves a biography and there's a lot there's a lot to his life and obviously a lot more than what i mentioned in the half an hour here. there's more about him in the uh, baseball 12 and there's more about him in my book well i i know your article is more is uh is great it's extensive and uh you know i congratulate you on it uh we're going to say more about tom's book uh, Tom, uh, when uh, I won't, I don't want to steal Bob's thunder in his interview, right. but I, I'm sure he's going to want to talk to you a little bit about your book, and uh, uh, we'll cover that on 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 Saturday. Sounds good. Okay, Tom, if you would, would you close your slides? Yeah.